Thank you, Bill. Morning, church. So we want to start today with just a quick reflection on how your 2015 went. Um, so have a quick think. How did it actually go? When you were moving into 2015, did you have any, ex any expectations on what the year would bring? And did those expectations come about? Um, or did you have any things that um, you wanted to happen and didn't happen? Or did you have lots of events that were positive? Or did you have lots of events that were negative? Or was your 2015 kind of like most lives that you had probably a bit of both? So have a quick reflection. What did it look like? Do you feel like you experienced joy in 2015? Today we are talking about joy in a new season. How are we going to move into 2016? How are we going to embrace joy in 2016? Will this new season um, look different for you? Now, if you're new to this church or you are kind of been dragged along today, you have to realise Christians love to talk about seasons. Um, they love to pull or break life into a, a, a whole series of seasons. They'll talk about seasons of everything. They'll say, oh, I'm in a season of singleness at the moment, um, or I'm in a season of courtship, or I'm in a season of engagement, or I'm in a season of like loss, or I'm in a season of joy or new beginnings. We the Christians love talking about seasons. Like if you're in a cafe and you're hearing a whole bunch of people talking about how they're experiencing a new season, they're probably Christians. Um, it's just what we like to do. So I'm going to follow this theme and ask you, um, what is this new season, 2016, going to look like for you? Some people in the room may be thinking, new season, my, haven't, my life hasn't changed for years. Um, but I want to ask you, do you want something to change in 2016? Now, if you want to experience some sort of change in your life, you're probably going to have to actually change the way you do things. Um, you can't expect 2016 to be totally different to 2015 um, if you're not going to change anything. There's a, a well-used quote um, by Einstein, and we'll stick that up there, um, Nick. Um, he defines insanity as doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. This coming year, you're going to have to do something different if you want um, a different sort of year. Um, it's just a way it's got to be. And, and I believe if you, wanna, if you want your life to look different, you're going to actually have to start with your thoughts. You're going to have to start thinking differently. You can't expect life to actively change without creating a new mindset. Um, there's another famous quote um, that people throw around quite a bit. If we go to this next one, um, it's a bit hard to read there, but Margaret Thatcher kind of made it famous. Um, watch your thoughts, for they become your words. Watch your words, because they become actions. Watch your actions, for they become habits. Watch your habits, because they become character. Watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. You're going to have to watch your thoughts. You're going to have to change your thoughts. You'll have to have new thinking if you want your 2016 to be any different. Um, some of us have reoccurring thoughts that are causing you to act in a really predictable way. And those thoughts are, uh, will bring upon really predictable consequences. And so we really need to make sure we are thinking um, right. If you want to have joy in this new season of 2016, you're most likely going to have to start to look at life a little bit differently if you're not experiencing joy. So what is joy? What does it even look like? Um, when we're trying to define a concept, like an emotion, it's abstract. It's an abstract noun. And um, when you're trying to teach kids about nouns at school, um, it's really easy to teach um, nouns because it's, they're just things. You just, kids will just call out nouns. They'll go, ah, oh, table, carpet, um, seat, um, whiteboard, it's easy. Um, and because they're all kind of things, it's, it's quite easy. But um, nouns are basically naming words. And there are a lot of things in life 
that have names, but you can't actually physically touch. Happiness is just as real as a basketball or the seat that you're sitting on, um, but you can't touch it, can you? But it's just as real. But you can really, you can point to someone and pretty easily define what happiness is. If we look at a picture up here, it's pretty easy to point at that and go, wow, those kids are happy. Um, and they did. And we've seen a lot of that in the last couple of days over Christmas. I, um, I read something this morning, and I, <laughs> they said that they're estimating there's 20 million presents in Australia that are unwanted this, <laughs> this year. And they're estimating that's around $600 million people have spent um, on presents people won't actually want. Um, so hopefully for these kids that actually wanted those presents and that we're actually looking at real happiness. Um, but joy, what about joy? Joy goes one step further along. It's more abstract than happiness. I don't think you can actually point to a picture and actually say that is joy. It's a little bit harder. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to mix up joy, uh, but it's easy to mix up joy and happiness. They're two different things. Um, but joy is a real thing. Uh, most of us know when we're living our lives, when we are experiencing joy. And most of us know, and many of us know in this room, what it feels like when we're not experiencing joy in our lives. Um, it's certainly a real thing. How do we walk into 2016 and experience joy? Is it actually something we should pursue? Do we have any control over whether we experience joy or not? I love what Pastor Bill said the other um, week about, he had a little acronym for joy. He said, if you want joy in your life, the best way is to put Jesus first, J for Jesus, put others second, O for others, and put yourself third. Um, yourself third. And so if you go through life putting Jesus in the centre, making sure you spend most of your time looking after other people, caring for people, helping other people, and then looking after yourself at the end, you, there's a good chance, using that formula, you'll experience joy. I love that. That's a really good, um, a really good way of looking at, looking at it. But when I find that I try to pursue joy, I find that it's so easy for me to actually start pursuing happiness. And when I actually start pursuing happiness, I'm not sure about you, but I find myself start pursuing things like money. I start dreaming of things like how can I work less but then make more money? Like, how could I do that? And I start experiencing, like, I start imagining, I really want that new car. How good would it be to drive that car? That will bring me happiness. Or how good would that 75-inch Ultra HD TV be? And it would be so awesome if that could be on my, my wall and I could come home after a hard day of work. Hard day of work. Surely that will bring me happiness. And this is what you do. When we start pursuing happiness, it's so easy for us to start pursuing things. We start pursuing money. I'm not, I'm, maybe I'm alone in, in the room about that, but um, I know it, for me, that's, that's what happens. Um, and when I actually start, um, and then I go even further, and I go, maybe I'll even have more happiness if I make sure that my things are actually bigger, faster, and more expensive than all my friends' things. Um, and then when I start thinking like that, then I look at my friend's things, and when my friend just buys a new car and I haven't been able to get enough money for it yet, then I start feeling another abstract now, uh, envy. <laughs> and envy just eats away at my happiness. So this is, it's just a, a bad cycle to get in. Um, when we pursue feeling good, feeling happy, even feeling joyful, it's so easy in our culture to start pursuing objects or experiences that will bring me that positive emotion. But the stats actually say that these things don't really enhance our positive well-being at all, even though it seems like they would. Um, if we have a look at this little chart that um, it was a study a few years ago, um, what they found that over um, between 1973 and the early 2000s, the GDP in a country like UK, which is very similar to Australia, the GDP, the gross domestic product, actually almost doubled. That means that people had 
almost double the amount of cash and wealth to buy things and buy experiences. But that you can see that during that time, life satisfaction kind of just stayed the same. So we got even more money. We had more cash, but our life, our well-being, our, our happiness kind of just stuck on the same level. Uh, we can buy more stuff, but it's not making us any happier with our lives. So how do we experience the kind of joy that is detached from money, experiences, and things? When you read the Bible, you find there is a real connection between the concept of hope and the concept of joy. Um, And you find these two words kind of closely related in many passages in the Bible. Um, There's two examples in Romans, if we can get those up. In Romans 12, Paul says, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And he goes on in Romans 15, May the God of hope fill you of all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Joy and hope are very closely related. They're usually always intertwined. And it makes sense. When you kind of walk through life and you bump into people who are filled with joy, you can actually see that they're actually also filled with hope. And when you walk through life and find someone who's really hopeful about some things in the future, they're usually quite filled with joy. It's interrelated. They're usually always interrelated. Um, Tim mentioned the other week that the opposite of joy is not actually sadness, it's hopelessness. And for me, hope is a crucial element that is required for us to experience long-lasting joy in our lives. So, do you actually, do you have hope in your life? When you look into the future, what sort of reality do you see? Is it positive? Is it negative? And the thing about modern life is there's so many areas in our lives. There's our romantic lives. There's our careers. There's our financial statements. There's our friendships. There's our ministries. When you look into the future, do you see a positive future in those areas? Do you have hope? in those areas? Do you have a certainty that your expectations will be met for those areas in your life? Should we expect or hope for all these things to go as expected in our lives? Now, someone with no hope in their lives could say, well, it's easy for someone like you to have hope. You've got, look at all the things going for you. You you can have heaps of hope. What about me? I've got nothing going for me. My life's a mess. I have no hope at all. But we have to realize that hope is actually more about what's happening inside of us than it is about what's happening outside of us. Um, It's more about what's internal and not what is external. In fact, hope is actually about how we interpret our external world. Now, the classic example, the classical example, illustration is the glass half full, glass half empty example. Some people might see this glass depending on how I poured it and, and say that is a half empty glass and some people might say that's a half full glass. Um, some people might see things as positive and some people think, might see things as negative. But this is a way, it's just way too um, simplistic to explain the complexities of hope. Now, it might be, it, this illustration might be okay for someone like the male brain. We're simple creatures. <laughs> but the female brain, well, you need like a hundred glasses and then they're all kind of poured at different levels and then somehow then you can work out whether or not you know how they're feeling. Um, but, <laughs> but uh, maybe not, that's a bit rude. Um, <laughs> But it is. This is too simplistic. It's not, it's not a good illustration. We can't go through life simply looking at every event in our lives as good. So many events in life are actually shockingly bad. Some things that have happened to you are terrible, and it won't actually help for you to say they are good. If that doesn't help. For us to explain whether or not we have hope in our lives, we need to better understand the nature of pessimism 
and optimism. Now, pessimists are not simply defined as negative thinkers and optimists defined as positive thinkers. It goes deeper than that. When something bad or good happens, the optimist and pessimist will see the event differently, but one doesn't simply say it is good and the other one bad. So, you may not know this about yourself, but are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? Because if whatever you kind of are, whatever you kind of lean towards, because sometimes we're different in different circumstances, will determine how you look at the events in your life. Psychologists that have looked into pessimism and optimism have found that there are certain concepts that have helped us explain how different people interpret and explain their external world. There's three P words, if we put them up on the um, screen. Um, people will explain different events either personally, permanently, and pervasively. So, so we're all clear. When someone says something is personal, it's about them. They're taking it on themselves. It's about inside, it's not what, what's happening outside. When something is permanent, it means that it's going to probably happen indefinitely. It's gonna happen, they're going to feel like it's going to be forever. And when something is pervasive, pervasive means it's gonna, it kind of reaches across all of your life. It's not just one part of your life, it's kind of everything about your life. And so when optimists and pessimists look into a, a look into a, an event, they will see it differently. Uh, and they'll see it using these kind of um, lenses. So if we take it in a, a, an example, if we go to the next one, um, now, a pessimist, and a bad event will happen, and they will see that bad event as a personal, permanent, and pervasive thing in their lives. So as an example, let's say taking, you're going for a job interview. You're, you're, you're sick of and tired of your job, and you're kind of desperate to get out of it, and you see in the paper on the net, the perfect job, your ideal job, so you spend all your time for the next couple of days, preparing for this interview. You get into the interview, you smash the interview, you, do, you feel like you've done everything you can um, to get this job. You're waiting for a few days, and then you get the phone call, and they say, unfortunately, you're not successful for this job. Now, the pessimist will see this event. It's a bad event. They want that job. It's a bad event. They will see this event very personally. They'll see it as permanent and they'll see it as pervasive. They'll say things like, ah, oh, this always happens to me. Why does this always happen to me? This, I will never get the job I want. I'm going to be stuck in this forever. This is affecting all of my life. They will see it personally, permanently, and pervasively. The optimist sees it in a different way. Let's just flick it to the next one. The optimist will see the bad event, but they will not make it personal, permanent, and pervasive. They will say things like, if they didn't get the job, they still want it, but they're like, ah, it just must not have been the right job for me. Um, someone else must have been better suited for that job. It's okay, there'll be another job out there for me. This isn't the end of the world. And you know what? It's just a job. I have a beautiful family. It's not everything. They won't see it personally, permanently, and pervasively. Now, the other thing about optimism and pessimism, it's not just about bad events. They look at good events differently, too. If we flick to the next one, the optimist will see the good event differently. They flip their thinking now, and they actually now make good events personal, permanent, and pervasive. So the, the optimist, say they get the job, they've, they've done the interview, they feel like it's gone really well, they wait a few days, they get the phone call, and they, they say, yes, you are successful, you got the job. Now the optimist will say, wow, I got the job, this is the job I want, and I must have deserved this job. I put a lot of effort in, I've, done a lot of, I've had a lot of experience, I actually deserve this job. Um, and you know what? This is good. This is going to last for a while. This is going to be a good thing. This job is going to affect so many parts of my life. Um, where the pessimist will see this good event differently too. If we flick it, the pessimists will flick their thinking and they won't see it as personal, permanent, or pervasive. They might get this, this job, it's amazing, and they're like, whoa, well, there must not have been anyone else at the interview. <laughs> I got this job by default. That's, a, that's the only way that I could have got this job. And you know what? I don't know how to do this job. They're going to figure it out. I'm not even going to keep this job. It's not going to be permanent. Um, 
And then they might even go further and go, you know what? This job's actually 10 minutes further drive. Oh, this is going to be a wreck. I'm going to have to go through traffic. They will see it, they won't see it um, pervasively. The optimist and pessimist will see events differently. And it, it's the way that you see the world determines the, um, the, the level of hope we have in our lives. I believe the amount of hope we have in our lives helps determine how much lasting joy we have in our lives, no matter what season we're in. Um, there's a great passage in Lamentations, if we just get that up on the screen. Um, it's in the message translation, so I'll just have a read. Uh, I'll never forget the trouble, the utter lostness, the taste of ashes, the poison I've swallowed. I remember it all. Oh, how well I remember the feeling of hitting the bottom. But there's one other thing I remember, and remembering I keep a grip on hope. God's loyal love couldn't have run out. His merciful love couldn't have dried up. They're, they're created every new morning. How great your faithfulness. I'm sticking with God. I say it over and over. He's all I've got left. Now, when this was written, it was a shocking circumstance for the, the people of God. The Israelites had just been attacked by the Babylonians and they had lost terribly. And what basically happened is their temple got destroyed, thousands of people died, thousands of other people got shipped off and exiled into another foreign land and the people left literally had nothing but their lives. They lost everything. And Lamentations kind of describes this and the author doesn't hide away from the details the author um, acknowledges that this is a shocking situation. The writer doesn't sugarcoat the terrible events happening to the people of God. The first two and a half chapters um, of this um, book goes into great detail about how bad the situation was. But in the midst of despair, there is a message of hope. And the hope is clearly centered on the love of God. A couple of years ago, um, my brother was diagnosed um, with cancer, and it came out of nowhere. He was totally fine, his health was good, and he, um, one day he had a huge pain at his side, that's shockingly pain, so we took him to the hospital straight away, and they just said, it was just in the appendix region, so they said, oh, you've got appendicitis. Um, and so they go in, they cut, cut him open, and they just find all this growth all over his organs. Um, and then we, we come out of that and they say that he's got stage four cancer. Um, now this is, that came out of nowhere. He was 33, he, had, he was in good health, and this came out of nowhere. And unfortunately, 11 months later, my brother passed away. This is a shocking event. A lot of you in this room have gone through something like this. Um, and through that time, I was experiencing a range of emotions. Anger, sadness, doubts, um, feeling lost. It's just all those natural emotions. A few times I called out to God saying, why, if you loved us, if you loved Aaron, why wouldn't you just heal him? If you're God of love, why wouldn't you hear it, heal him? But so many times during the 11 months, and I was, we were so blessed that we had 11 months with him and we could spend that time with him. So many people don't get that time when that, these kind of things happen. Um, but... During that time, so many times, God kind of encouraged me, saying, the hope, your hope shouldn't be in your brother getting well. Your hope should be in me and in Jesus Christ. Your hope should be in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because the amazing thing about the Christian message is that because Jesus died and rose again, we have the hope of the resurrection. My brother will rise again one day. He was a Christian man. He will rise again one day and the cancer will be no longer. The cancer did not win. It didn't win. Christ won for Aaron. And so I will see Aaron again. And that is the hope that the Christian message has. It's really, really powerful. Even though that time is sad. I think about him every day still. I'm still sad. There's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with being sad. But I have hope. Um, and in turn, I actually have joy in that too. It's really powerful. Who or what is your hope in? I love this idea of those three Ps, personal, pervasive, and permanent. 
And I've actually used this idea to slowly shift my mindset, as I'm kind of a naturally pessimistic guy. And it works. When you actually start filtering your thoughts, you're actually in interpreting your thoughts on how you're thinking about different events, you actually um, can, you can make that shift. Your personality isn't actually locked in. Brain scientists actually say, with effort, you can change these thoughts. It's amazing. Um, and so I've used that. Um, however, this idea from psychology doesn't actually go far enough. It is possible to make that shift. However, what and who we put our hope in is very important. Pop psychology and the self-help movement, movement, people like Oprah, are pushing an idea, a message that you can actually draw all your strength that you need to have a successful life from within. But that can really only go so far. I just find so often that the human, um, human spirit, the human nature, falls short so easily. If I rely on myself, my own potential, my own abilities. I always fall short. I can only go so far if all my hope and optimism is based on my capabilities. The Christian worldview is different. The Christian worldview is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. The Christian worldview is centered around what God has already done and what he is already doing in you and me, not about what we do or what we become. And the great thing is, is that within this Christian worldview, our hope comes from both externally and internally. You see, when we chase happiness, or our hope is always usually something entirely external. We often look to money, possessions, and experiences to live a happy life. But nev that never really quenches our thirst. When we chase this kind of secular hope, then we find our hope by explaining our external worlds in an optimistic way. But when we chase a hope centered on Jesus Christ, we find the love of God. And this love is external and internal. God's love for you has existed forever, externally. But when we hold on to God, when we chase after Him, when we place our hope in His Son, the love of God comes into you and actually becomes internal. And this love can change the way you see your world. This love can change the way you see your marriage. This love can, it will change the way you see yourself. The Christian worldview, centered around Jesus Christ, is actually personal, permanent, and pervasive. The Christian worldview is actually the most optimistic way of seeing life. We can have, we've got heaps of Bible passages that can explain this. If we go to this next one, there's a famous parable by Jesus about the lost sheep in Luke 15. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I've found my lost sheep, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. God's love is personal. It is for you. God loves you personally. He loves you individually. And it's, it, it hasn't changed. Um, it's a person. It's not, he's not this distant God who says he loves the world but doesn't want to be involved in your life. He loves and cares for you personally. It's personal. God's love is permanent. If we go to the next one, in Romans 8, um, Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through the love, um, through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. God's love for you is permanent. It's indefinite. It will go on forever. It has been going on forever, and it will keep on going on forever. It's a permanent love for you. This is amazing news. And God's love is pervasive. It, will, it spreads over your whole life. The last um, passage here, 
um, is in Ephesians. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses all knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness, fullness of God. God's love goes over your whole life. There are areas in your life that is fi- are filled with shame. God's love still spreads over those areas. There's, God, there's places in your life, there's things in your life your spouse doesn't even know about you. God's love fills those areas. It fills up your whole life. It's pervasive. It spreads over the whole thing. This is why it's so hopeful. This hope, this hope firmly centered on the love of God through Jesus Christ has a predictable consequence in our lives. Like I said at the beginning, some thoughts have predictable actions and some actions have predictable consequences. This hope has a predictable consequence in our lives. It's joy. It's joy. The joy that this brings is entirely internal. It doesn't require a promotion, a girlfriend, or even a loved one to get better, even if we want our loved ones to get better. This joy is totally wrapped up in the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Placing our hope in Jesus Christ won't stop bad things happening to you, but it will guide you through the toughest of times. I don't know what your 2015 looked like. I don't know if it was filled with joy or or filled with hopelessness. I don't know if you were chasing after things that just didn't help how you felt about yourself or about how, how you felt about your life. But in this new season, in this 2016, what are you going to do differently? How are you going to think differently? For many of us, Maybe we need to start making the shift from a pessimistic worldview to an optimistic one. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're an optimist. I've met plenty of Christians who are grumpy, pessimistic, and I'm sure if you've laughed, you've met plenty of other people like that too. Christianity doesn't mean you're an optimist. You have to make that act of change. Um, You actually have to start making the shift from pessimism to optimism. Catching your eternal thoughts, catching your sentence starters. Are you starting sentences like this? If something good happens, are you starting things like, oh, no, on my luck, this isn't going to turn out the way I want it to anyway? Or when something bad happens, do you go, oh, that would be right, this always happens. Those kind of sentence starters breathe pessimism. You need to shift, you need to catch those thoughts, you need to catch those sentence starters and change the way you think. It's the only way you'll start changing your worldview. Um, but even more than that, hope and in turn joy actually starts with gratitude. If you are a thankful person, there is a huge chance your outlook will be optimistic. In 1 Thessalonians, um, Nick, if we can put that one up, Paul says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now this is, you've got to actually be careful where you throw this one around. I, I foolishly threw this around at a, at a bad time once. There was a guy I was with, and he, was, um, he, was, he just found out something that was, um, that was bringing him, going to bring him a lot of grief. And he kind of put himself in that situation. But he was, he was angry and he was sad and all these emotions. And I thought it was wise enough to go, hey, remember, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. And he said, Adrian, if you keep talking, I'm going to smack you in the face. <laughs> it's a dangerous verse. Don't throw it around willy-nilly. You need to be careful. It's a very true verse, but when someone's experiencing deep grief, you don't just throw it around like it's, it's an easy thing to do. You shouldn't do that. And I learned that from us. Luckily, I didn't get hit. But, um, but it's a verse that, to be honest, has for a long time annoyed me. Because the cynic in me goes, how can you rejoice always? What happens when you're really bored? How can you rejoice when you're bored? But <laughs> this word rejoice is actually... The verb, the action word of joy. 
Joy is this abstract term that's so hard to define. But to rejoice means to actually make your joy known to others, to put it out there and make it alive for others to see. That's what rejoice means. And how do you do that? Well, you've got to be praying and giving thanks continually. You've got to be thanking God continually. Um, In 2016, if you are not already, become a thankful person. Become a person filled with gratitude. When you pray, thank God continually about, about the blessings He has already given you, not just about the blessings you want in the future. 